way can better than I F I Y M. I F Y I M. Sorry. So Andre, Andre, Andre. It yes. looks like. So Andre asked the question: Is carb cycling better than um, I F Y M? Right. Yes. If it fits your macros. Andre, good question, but it's kind of like imagine right now that I had an apple on my hand, and then this hand I had an orange, and I tried to compare the two, right? So you can't really compare it to IFYM, like if it fits your macros and carb cycling are two different things. If it fits your macros, the, the general concept behind that is that it, as long as you hit your macros, it doesn't matter if I get it from frosted flakes or broccoli, as long as it fits my macros. So first off, it does matter, but <laughs> that is a technique that can be used for fat loss. I'm just gonna just preface that with, it does matter. Um, secondly though, so we move past this, go to carb cycling. Carb cycling is an excellent technique. And tomorrow, if you tune in on Facebook Live, we'll talk about um, the science behind carb cycling. So, good question, but again, apples and oranges. So, moving on to the next question. I am Sherry asks, compared to traditional cyclic keto, uh, when you normally do a two-day carb up, um, she wants to compare it versus a one-day keto where you only carve up for about six hours. Um, kind of with with that question, is the um, is the one-day carb up better for sparing muscle than the two-day carb up? Okay, let's go to six. So guys, listen. We have our definitions. Ketogenic dieting: 75% of your diet is fat, 20% of it, 20-25% is protein, less than 10% is really carb, right? Um, Cyclic ketogenic dieting, if you go to the original books, they would have you like do keto for four days and carb up for, for three days, okay? I can tell you right now, that's garbage. Um, but now let's go to more of a traditional where it's like, you keep, go keto for five days and you carb up for two days and you're dieting. Our lab tested that. Um, Ryan Lowry is working on the paper right now. Our, our team's working on the paper. We did test that out and we presented that data. When you carve up for five days, excuse me, when you do a keto for five days and you carve up for two, and you're dieting, we found you lost muscle because you never get a chance to keto adapt. And because of that, um, ketone levels never get high enough to spare muscle. So you lose a lot of muscle. So I am Sherry is asking, what if I only carved up for one day? And what if I constrain that carb up to six hours? No one's tested that on a simple ketogenic diet. But I am gonna say this, a six hour feeding period is what? It's intermittent fasting, okay? Studies do show that intermittent fasting allows you to get ketone levels up so that you're actually kind of in nutritional ketosis. So I am sharing, I would postulate, and it's gotta be tested, that likely you'd be able to get right back into ketosis with that, and that that would be a form of cyclic ketogenic dieting that likely would sp still spare muscle. Um, so I don't know that cyclic's ideal, but if you were to choose one, doing an intermittent fast with ketogenic dieting would be good. All right, what do we got? So Bento.Kelly, so I'm assuming Kelly Bento asks, um, the efficacious dose of phosphodiesterine Okay, so bento.kelly, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, but I, first off, what's phosphatidylserine? It isn't efficacious at all, right? So phosphatidylserine, like the name suggests, is a phospholipid. Um, and the cool thing about it is our lab actually did an experiment. If Jordan Joy, if you're watching this, uh, actually Andy needs to work with Jordan Joy. Um, we did an experiment ourselves. Jordan Joy, we also teamed up with... Um, Ralph Yeager, and Troy Hornberger, who's a world, world expert on phospholipids. So it's, it's an area near and dear to our heart because we've actually tested this. We took all the, all the fats you could think of, and we took muscle cells, and we bathed them in these fat, fats. And we found that, at a, a, that of all those fat, uh, like phospholipids and fats, phosphatidylserine actually can stimulate protein synthesis. So it's anabolic, but on top of that, it buffers stress. And so phosphatidylserine is high in concentration in your brain. Like there's a lot of phospholipids in your brain. Phosphatidylserine is very high in concentration in your brain. 
So when you, an efficacious dose, if you want to get an effect soon, is going to be like 1,200 milligrams. 1,200 milligrams. Now, if you load it for, for a long time, 250 to 500 milligrams a day over like a month should load into your brain and get an efficacious effect. Besides being anabolic, the main thing we know about acetylserine does is buffer stress. You're not as stressed. So like me, I don't, especially when like I'm traveling a lot, I don't get a lot of sleep, cortisol levels are gonna be a lot higher. It buffers that. So again, over a long term, like a month, four or 500 milligrams, maybe 250, as low as 250. If you more wanna get an effect within a week's time, probably like 1200 milligrams. Good question. What's next? Uh, Kyle, I and me asks, I should, should I count net carbs or overall carbs in my um, ketogenic diet? All right, Kyle.IND. <laughs> no, no doc. No, just Kyle IND? Yes. All right, Kyle IND asks, um, should I go net carbs or total carbs? To be honest, it's a really good question. Kyle, I'm gonna tell you something right now. When we're talking about net carbs, okay, basically it's important to understand that we're, we're cutting out the, we're, we're not counting fiber, and that's what Kyle's talking about, which is real tricky if you're looking at protein bars, but that's a whole nother topic. So uh, if it's a true fiber, I would count net carbs, and I'll tell you why. You need to get fiber. So if you're just like, oh, I gotta get 20 grams or 25 grams a day, and you're counting, you know, you're trying to lower everything, including fiber, that's a problem. Because fiber, when it goes to the large intestine, creates short-chain fatty acids, and those short-chain fatty acids are things like butyrate. And butyrate, you know, is, is, is a fat. So you, you want to go net carbs and keep your gut health healthy. So, uh, yeah, so Andy's going to go ahead and read a, a, two live questions. Um, someone goes, can saturated fat impede fat loss even when you're keto? Great question. Um, no. Saturated fat is not going to impede fat loss when you're keto. In fact, saturated fatty acids might enhance things like testosterone levels. It's, it's not going to have negative health effects when your carbs are low. Great question. They think it'll be beneficial. So, Tim Greslick, um, thoughts on myostatin and its reduction? So, I'm guessing Tim is thinking about myostatin inhibitors. Yeah. Tim, listen, first off, myostatin is basically, think of it as like a control mechanism. Everyone hears about myostatin, okay? So, basically, when myostatin first came out, actually, my old major professor gets cited all the time. I worked with him a lot. I've looked at myostatin myself. Myostatin, think of that as a, a control regulator. It puts the brakes on being able to gain muscle. When we lift weights, we actually inhibit myostatin. That's part of the way we grow. If you take the brakes out, like if you knock the myostatin gene out, you grow uncontrollable. Um, look up like the Belgian blue uh, bull. Uh, um, it's, it's this jack bull or myostatin deficient dog. There's these dogs that are just like jack. I actually think that a lot of pro bodybuilders have some myostatin deficiencies. So the, the golden ticket is can I target myostatin? One of my colleagues, Yuha Omi, has actually done that and you see a lot of muscle growth when you have myostatin inhibitors, that's pharmacological. You're inhibiting it with pharmaceuticals. As far as supplements on the market, creatine actually inhibits myostatin. Um, actually, you know, there's some data that like higher protein diets might somewhat lower myostatin. Obviously, it's not to crazy levels. And, um, you know, we've done research on the supplement for atropin. We just got a, a, um, a study published on it with Mike Roberts. And we did find that the receptor for myostatin was kind of inhibited with the fortitropin um, supplement. So, um, again, there's a lot, really we need a lot more research on this topic. But certainly, it's an area to look into. Uh, we'll take one more question. Okay. Well, one quick question. Santiago, we're going to answer that question on tomorrow's Periscope. Um, okay. So, what is the best advice to get back into ketosis following post-contest prep? Chaos gorging on carbs when the cravings are running wild. So, all right. <laughs> Who's this? Who's this? Um, that one is Georgie. Georgie. Last question, Georgie asks, 
if basically I, I come out of a contest and I binge, okay? Like all of us have gone on long diets and then like kind of binge, right? So if I go on if I go on a contest and I binge, how do I get back into ketosis? To answer the question, I have really two, three parts to that. Number one, intermittent fasting, right? So constrain your feeding period to like a four hour, four to eight hour period, so really four to six hours. That should get you back into ketosis within one to two days. Number two, glucose disposal agents like berberine. Berberine will lower blood glucose. And to be quite honest with you, exogenous ketones. Exogenous ketones um, will, will actually help you. They lower blood glucose and they actually get ketone levels higher so you don't feel horrible when you're going over. 